Welcome to video 12A. In this video, we discuss compensation. Uh, again, as a reminder, if you haven't read yet, make sure you look at the reading assignment. There's large swaths of chapter 12 that are unassigned that we simply don't cover. Okay, let's get started. So the learning objectives for chapter 12 are to talk about the tax implications of compensation from salary and wages from both the employee and employer's perspective. And then we talk a little bit more about fringe benefits. Okay, employee salary and wages is largely handled by the employer. So let's think about how all this works. So the first is income taxes are pretty much automatically withheld from the pay. We'll talk about more about how that withholding comes about in a second. And employment taxes are also simply withheld. And then on top of that, it's the employer's job to reconcile the wages paid and employment taxes and remit those amount to the taxing authorities. So again, the employer is doing all the work. And then what happens is the employee at year end basically just receives a reporting from them. So form W-2 is provided at calendar year end. I think they're usually by January 31st. And it reports taxable wages, Social Security wages, Medicare wages, and all withholding. So the employer is doing all the heavy lifting when it comes to salary and wage tax reporting and compliance. So let's say Bumblebee Guy's salary is $50,000. And Bumblebee Guy elects to contribute 10% of his pay or 5,000 to the company's 401k plan. And that's just a qualified retirement plan, which we don't really cover in this course, but uh, I think you'll see how this works out in this simple example. So on uh, BBG's form W-2 in box one, where it says taxable wages, it, the employer would report 45,000. That's his salary of 50 less the 5,000 he contributed to the 401k plan. In box three, which is his social security wages, he would report the full 50,000, the employer would report the full 50,000. So it's really the employer's job to tie down box one so that all the employees know how much their taxable wages were for the year. So here's an example of a W-2 and you can see box one, wages, tips, and other compensation, you pretty much just report that directly onto the Form 1040. Federal income tax withheld is reported in Box 2. Box 12A picks up items that usually reconcile your gross wage to what's in Box 1. So Box 12 would be that 401k contribution we just looked at. That would be reported there. And then lest we forget, down in the bottom of the W-2, uh, this class pretty much focuses on federal tax. We'll get the state tax in the end. But state wages and state income tax withheld are both important as well. And those are reported down in boxes 16 and 17. Okay, so this withholding problem is one of the enigmas of the tax world, in my opinion. And the reason that's true is that um, when people have uh, an amount they owe to the IRS at year end, that probably means they screwed up their withholding, or if their refund is too large, they screwed up their withholding. And so not a lot of attention is given to this Form W-4. In fact, most new employees, they go in, they fill out the W-4, they don't pay a lot of attention, and then they never fill out another one ever again. And there was a lot of hubbub in uh, 2018 about changes to the tax law and changes to withholding. And what happened is a number of taxpayers had smaller refunds than they were used to. And that's in spite of the fact that probably their, their tax liability went down, but their withholding went uh, down as well because of the way the withholding system works. So there was a big push to get people to complete new W-4s at the beginning. So if you think about this W-4, if you haven't seen one, we're going to show an example of one here shortly. It really just says, uh, are you single or married filing jointly? Do you withhold the number of personal allowances that you want to claim? And that has to do with what that standard deduction amount would be or what the, the number of child tax credits you would take. 
And uh, then if you want any additional tax withheld uh, based on the number of allowances you claim. So income tax withholding is without question not an exact science. So the more complex the taxpayer, the more likely that you would need to do a complete forecast of tax liability to do a good job with, with withholding. So the other thing is some jobs aren't subject to withholding. If you're self-employed and you do a Schedule C, uh, you know that you have to do your own estimated tax payments. And so as a result, your employer, there isn't one to do any withholding. And so, you know, the more complex situation you have, the more likely you're going to need some professional advice. That's where people are going to hire folks like you. Okay, so the tables are constructed to create a refund situation. So as you can imagine, it's in the government's best interest to make sure your withholding is always in excess of your liability. And of course, you can adjust this at any time during the year. Anytime you want to go in and fill out a new W-4 for your employer, you can do so. All right, so here's the 2019 W-4. And this is presumably a, uh, if you've been an employee before, this is a look or feel that you've seen before. You give it some, some of your identifying information. And then everything comes on line five. So line five says total number of allowances you're claiming. And then it says go to the worksheets on the following page. So you're going to put some, some numeral on line five. And then you're going to sign it and send it in unless you're exempt. And then you write exempt on line seven. Okay, so let's talk about, since all the work is in the worksheets, let's talk about what these worksheets look like. So here's the 2019 worksheets. And again, if you've been an employee, you recognize this. Uh, line A, enter one for yourself. Enter one if you're married, filing jointly. Enter one if you're head of household. And then line D, enter one if you're single, separate, and only have one job. Or if you're married, filing jointly, and only have one job. Or... If your wages from the second job or spouse's wages are 1500 bucks or less. Okay, then kind of new for 2019 is this amount on line E for child tax credit. And you can see that it bakes in the amount of income that you have. And uh, that's based on, you know, maybe some of these credits or deductions being phased out on you. So um, otherwise, you just enter in the amount that you have. So the child tax credit has some phase out amounts, you'd count up each eligible child and put that number in. And then, uh, as you know, there's a credit for other dependents. There's not just the child tax credit. So again, same thing. If you have dependents that are your children or not your children, but don't qualify for the child tax credit, you take care of them on line F. If you have any other credits, uh, you would go to a separate worksheet, enter in something, enter in those amounts. You total it all up. And then, boom, you carry that over to um, the front page of the W-4. But down at the bottom, it says, if you plan to itemize or do some other things, you may want to fill out some other worksheets. So here's an other worksheet that says, if you itemize and you fill out this and say how much your itemizations are, and it will make an adjustment to the number of personal allowances that you make. So let's, let's just do an example of this. And so what I'm going to suggest is if you have the lecture slides, uh, I'll post a blank W-4 and you can work along with me if you want, or you can just watch me. It's up to you. I don't really see us doing a uh, exam question on the W-4. It's just that as a, as a tax professional for all of these years, um, probably the biggest complaint clients always have is under withholding. And you really should help them pay closer attention to their W-4 so they can do it right. So if you want to be a tax nerd, here's a chance to dial in. If you don't want to be a tax nerd, maybe just follow along. Okay, so I'll, I'll uh, let you guys read this uh, in the printed slides, and then we're going to go out uh, in, into the PDF and fill out the W-4 for Homer in March. All right, here we are at the W-4. <clears throat> and again, W the front page is really pretty much just a summary. So you, you fill that in last. Well, you can fill the top part, your name and address and all the other things first. But uh, the amount of deductions really comes from this worksheet. Okay, so let's think about doing this. Uh, and we'll just make Homer the primary taxpayer. I'm not trying to be sexist about it. Let's just say his job pays more. 
Um, so enter one for yourself. <clears throat> Homer and Mars do file jointly, so they'd enter another one. So C, nothing. D, nothing, because they're married filing jointly, but the spouse does work. Now, that's, it's true that the spouse doesn't have an, an employer, but she does work. She does that catering business on the side. So we skip D, we go down to E. We say, okay, if your total income will be less than 71, 2101, or 103, 351, uh, if married filing jointly, and a four for each eligible, eligible child. Well, that's not true. Their income actually will exceed that amount, right? So Homer makes 90,000 and Marge makes, uh, I think, 15. So they exceed that amount based on their 2018 estimates. And remember, that's what you do, right? I mean, we're, we're filling out this worksheet at the beginning of the year. The best hope you have is last year's information. So let's assume that they don't really think it's going to change a lot. So their income would exceed that amount. Uh, if your own total income will be from 103 to 345, 850, enter two for each eligible child. Well, the Simpsons have two children. They have three children total, but only two are eligible for the child tax credit because they're under the age of 16 uh, in 2019. So as a result, we would enter two for each eligible child. So that's four. Okay, so we don't need to worry about the rest because that doesn't apply to us. There is a credit for another dependent. Again, it's the same thing. Their income is going to be in this bracket. They have one other dependent, so they'll simply enter one. Okay, now we're going to assume they don't have any earned income credits or any American Opportunities credit. They didn't have any kids in, in uh, college, so we'll assume nothing there, and we'll simply total these to seven and say we're looking pretty good. Now, we could go back and enter seven on line five if we want, but let's read these caveats at the bottom of the worksheet. Okay, if you plan to itemize, well, wait, they do. They itemized last year. So we might want to work on the deductions, adjustments, and additional income worksheet. Okay, well, let's do that. So what was an estimate of 2019 itemized deductions? Well, why don't we just say it's whatever last year's were? Right. Do we really know that it's going to be different? I don't know. Maybe we know, for example, mortgage interest usually goes down every year because as you pay down the principal, uh, you actually pay down uh, the amount of interest you owe on that principal. So that often slides down a little bit, but that's frequently offset. You know, our property taxes go up a little bit. Um, don't really know about charitable contributions unless you've decided you're going to make about the same amount last year as you did this year. Okay, and then we would enter there 24-4. Now, what is 24-4? That's the standard deduction for married filing jointly, right? So then subtract two from one. Let's think about what that represents. So think about that. Whoops, I missed the line. That represents the additional deduction that they're going to get over the standard deduction because the withholding tables as they're constructed are built assuming you just take the standard deduction. So when you itemize, in theory, you're lowering your tax beyond that. And so you would want the number of allowances that you claim to go up. More allowances, less withholding. Okay, let's keep working through. Enter an estimate of your adjustments to income, qualified business income deduction, and any additional standard deduction for age or blindness. All right, so we're going to assume no adjustments for income. So let's think about what those adjustments to income are. Those are, if you take in the individual course, those are the four AGI adjustments. So things like self-employed uh, taxes, things like self-employed health care that we talked about, uh, any contributions to IRAs, uh, the tuition deduction, if you take that, the educator's expense, if you take that. So there are a handful of things in there that you would worry about here. But recall that Marge is going to have um, qualify business, right? So let's assume it's going to be the same 15,000. So she would take a $3,000 QBI. Total those up, we get 5,600. Okay, what is an estimate of her non wage income not subject to withholding, such as interest and dividends? Well, let's say that's the $5,000. Whoops, did it again. That's the $5,000 of interest and dividends that they earned last year. 
Okay, so let's think about what we just did in this net net summation. We added up all these additional deductions they might get. And then we said, well, what additional forms of income do you have? Now on line seven, let's just net those together. Oops, sorry, it's actually uh, less than zero, isn't it? Subtract six from five. No, it's the opposite. There we go. So it looks like they would have an additional deduction of $600 kind of on the net net basis. Okay, then it's a divide that amount by 4,200. So 4,200 must be the amount of um, tax that would be withheld for each person. And so uh, 4,200, the 600 divided by 4,200 is less than zero. It's 0.1429. It says if it's an it's not a negative amount, but if it was enter in parentheses, drop any fraction. Well, if I drop any fraction, that just becomes ah, tag on it. That just becomes zero, right? Because it's less than one. And then it says enter the number of personal allowances from above. Well, that number was seven, so we end up with seven. Okay. It also says if you plan to use the two earners multiple jobs worksheet. Also enter this total on line one of the worksheet on page four. Otherwise, stop here. Now, we're not going to go through the process of doing the, oh, shoot, we might as well. Let's go through the process of the two earner worksheet. Okay. So use this worksheet only if they direct you here. Well, there are two earners here, so in theory, we need to take care of it. So first, we pop in the seven that we calculated. Uh, on the previous worksheet. And it says, find the number in table one for the lowest paying job. All right, well, Marge has the lowest paying job. They're married filing jointly. It's 15,000, so it looks like we pick up two. So what's happened is we're, we're putting in, whoa, stop sliding around, there we go. Two allowances there. Okay, it says, if line one is more than or equal to line two, which it is, subtract, and now we're done, okay? So what happened is, think about this adjustment that we just made. So it said, let's pretend like Homer's the only income uh, generator. And then let's consider all those other forms of income except for that second job, right? Marge's job. And let's calculate what the right number of allowances would be. Okay, now, Let's consider that second job. Well, that second job is going to create more income, so you need to reduce the number of allowances by the amount suggested through the table and get to the amount you would record. So now we go all the way up and we'd say five. Okay, so that's how you complete a W-4 in 2019. The good news is, is late last week, the IRS issued a new draft W-4. Why don't we just take a look at it? I absolutely will not hold you responsible for it. Okay, here's the new 2020 draft W-4, and it is different. Okay, so same information at the top. We're very used to seeing that. Uh, and you fill out your single, married, final, joint, head of household. You could be done right there. That would be it. And then what happens, recall, even the old system, the default was you're just taking a standard deduction. Right. So that's all the information they would need to just take it based on the standard deduction. OK, it says otherwise keep going. OK, step two, do you need to account for multiple jobs? If you account for multiple jobs, you do a little worksheet that accounts for multiple jobs. Step three, do you have dependents? Right. So if you have these dependents, you get the child tax credit or the other dependent credit. Same thing. We're going to adjust on this. Step four is that other adjustment category, right? So that's the interest in dividends and, and some of these other adjustments that they might be eligible for. And we're going to net all those together and see what that would create. And then ultimately, you're done. That's it. That's all you do. Now, that's not to say there aren't worksheets. You can see there are worksheets. Here's the two job worksheet, right, where you would take care of that additional income. Here's the table that's not yet completed that would talk about the amount that you're going to reduce that by. And then the IRS is preparing, uh, for those of us that really want to do it the easy way, they're preparing an online calculator. This has been very popular with the earned income tax credit. Um, 
that you walk through the steps to determine, and it does a step-by-step -step calculation online to help you determine what your withholding would be. Okay, I think we spent enough time on this W-4. Let's go back to the slides. So just for funsies, let's say that their 2019, Homer and Marge's 2019, Homer's income came in at 96,000. Marge ended up making 16,000. Their interest was a little bit higher and their qualified dividends were a little bit higher and their itemized deductions were a little bit lower. So what I did is I calculated what their withholding would be using uh, what's known as uh, publication 15 or circular C. Uh, so if you're a payroll person, you, you really know what that uh, book is all about. So I calculated their gross income got to their taxable income, calculated what their tax liability is, and applied credits to it. So their net tax liability in 2019, based on that information, would be 6430. If they, in fact, used five allowances like we just filled out, their withholding would have been 7196. They would have had a refund of $766. If for some reason they had put six allowances down, just to show you more or less what the sensitivity is, uh, they would have had withholding of 66.92 and a refund of only $262, okay? So you can see that difference is about $500 for these particular taxpayers uh, per additional allowance. If they had done one less, no surprise, their refund would have been about $500 higher uh, than it is currently. Okay. So I want to point out one last thing because for whatever reason, uh, there's this really complicated system, but there's also a really easy way. So let's say that you've notoriously been doing this year in and year out and you feel like, you know what, my refund's never high enough. You can always just go to line six and say, just withhold this additional dollar amount per paycheck. So for example, if you were paid on a monthly basis, you could just say, oh, put $100 down on line six, and they're just gonna withhold $100 from your pay. And it's got nothing to do with the allowances, you're just telling them to. So this would have been really good, for example, for Homer and Mars if they wanted to avoid uh, any of the uh, estimated tax payments for Marge's side business, her catering business, they could just say, well, look, Marge makes about 16 grand. What's the tax rate on that? Let's say it's, you know, 22%. It's probably 12% to be honest, but um, they would say, okay, well, what is that divided by 12? Homer, just have that amount withheld from your paycheck every month. And then you don't have to worry about all the complicated worksheets and all the other things. So know that that's out there. It's also very helpful if you realize halfway through the year that your withholding is too much or too little. So obviously changing your allowances works, but it only works prospectively. So if you discover your mistake in July, that's great. They'll start the new withholding amount, but they'll treat it as if it's for all 12 months. It's not going to fix it. So what you might want to do is say, well, I also need to catch up for all the previous months I underwithheld, you do that on line six. All right, now we truly have spent enough time on the W-4. Let's move on. Okay, employee considerations for salary and wages. Note that, look, salary and wages, they're deductible, right? So generally under the cash method, it's when they're paid. Under the accrual method, it would be when they're earned, but there is a restriction. You can only accrue it if it, in fact, is paid within two and a half months of year end. Now, look, any typical uh, salary or wage based employee, you know, let's say December 31st is on a Tuesday and you pay them once a week. So their paycheck, it comes Friday and Friday's December 3rd or 4th or whatever it might be. You know, that's clearly within two and a half months. So there's generally not a big deal about accruing compensation for, for an accrual based employer. Um, what you end up with down here is bonuses. That's really what we're talking about, right? So the idea is you can accrue bonuses to your employees as long as they are paid within two and a half months of year end. So again, the after tax cost of salary is less because of course you get to deduct that salary. So we've, we've done this after tax, right? Pre-tax equals, you know, after tax 
uh, sorry, after tax is pre-tax times one minus the tax rate. Well, that's true here. The after-tax cost of a deduction is the pre-tax deduction times one minus the tax rate. So if XYZ pays one of its employees 80,000 and XYZ is in the 21% tax bracket, which of course all corporations are, what is the after-tax cost of that salary? Well, it's just 80,000 times one minus 0.21 or 63.2. So because wages are deductible, the after-tax cost is always less than the pre-tax cost. There are limits, and one of the primary limits um, is whether compensation is reasonable in amount, right? So we talked about this uh, from the perspective of when you had a related party, right? So in other places this occurs is we'll see when you're an S corporation, you get a deduction for wages paid. And so uh, it's actually in your best interest to pay yourself no wages. I know that's a crazy story, but in any event, um, there's a reasonable test for compensation. You consider the duties of the employee, the complexities of the business, and the amount of salary compared to the income of the business. There's also a million dollar maximum annual compensation deduction per person on public companies for the five highest compensated officers, including the CEO and the CFO. Okay, so in the pre-2018 world, that rule didn't apply if that compensation was based on performance. And so what that meant is all public companies had performance-based compensation plans. Now, 2018 and after, so in the current world, that applies to all compensation to those five highest paid individuals. So there is a maximum deduction of a million dollars. Let's see what that looks like. So Krusty Burger is a public company and it pays its CEO, uh, Krusty the Crab, 900000 of salary and 700000 in performance-based compensation. And if you're wondering like what performance-based compensation would be, it says something like, you know, we pay you, you know, X percent of the profits of the company. Or if the stock price goes to Y, we'll pay you whatever. If it goes to Z, we'll pay you a different amount, this sort of thing. So it's based on the underlying performance of the individual or the company. Okay, so first let's look at 2017 because that's the, the easy version. So 2017, the pre-tax amount was 1.6 uh, million. The tax rate back in 2017 for large corporations was 35%. So you take the 1.6 million, multiply by 35%, you get tax savings of 560 or after-tax cost of a million dollars, 40,000. You could also, of course, take 1.6 million times one minus 0.35 and get the same amount. So in 2018 and beyond, however, the pre-tax cash outflow is still 1.6 million, but only a million dollars is deductible. Therefore, the tax savings is only 210,000, which means the after-tax cost of that compensation has gone up to almost 1.4 million. So you can see that capping that deduction uh, means that it costs more for a company to highly compensate those five most highly compensated individuals. So I think the idea here is uh, to deal with some of the inequality issues and some of these other things. Okay, that brings us to the end of video 12a. In 12b, we'll finish out chapter 12 talking about fringe benefits. Thanks for watching.